Good morning, guys. Or good afternoon on our Wednesday today. I hope you're doing well. If you're new to me, I'm Marshall Bircher, and I help codependents rediscover happiness by helping them heal, helping them know themselves, and helping them share themselves in healthy, proactive ways that generate happiness. That's the big goal, right? So uh, today we're going to be jumping into what's called attachment distress and whether or not you have it. And if you've been watching me for a while, it is likely that you have dealt with attachment distress in your life. And that's an important component about love addiction, about codependency. And it's a factor that we need to address and heal so that you can build secure attachment, both with yourself and with others in the world. And that allows you to be uh, more choosy, more decisive, and more effective in choosing and building relationships with people that you like, that you love, and that are in fact healthy. So before we get to that, I need to share this out to the community. Now, the community is a safe haven where you can find support and guidance and thriving beyond codependency. We, we tend to focus on what we do with the codependency, where we go when we discover it. It's not a large focus in, on understanding necessarily what narcissism is or abuse is, but what we do with it and moving forward with it. So you can find the link above on Facebook, below on YouTube, and if you're on YouTube, Hit that subscribe button. So let me get that shared out here because I'm just going to, the, the community is going to be like, what about us? You know, share, share. So let me hit that here. Come here, come here. Facebook moves their buttons around a lot. It drives me a little bit crazy. Okay. So good morning. It's nice to see you guys. So what on earth is attachment distress? Well, I have some notes that will guide us through this conversation because there's a little complexity to it, and I want to make sure we hit it all correctly. So first thing you need to do, or need to know, rather, is the attachment, what attachment is. Okay. So attachment is when we're emotionally bonded with another person, place, or thing. Uh, we feel like it's a part of our lives, they're a part of our lives, we're a part of their lives. We take up space in their mind, their heart, and their emotions. We, we show up and we're active in what's going on in their world. And we have the same with them. They're in our world. We consider them in our thoughts. We consider them in what we're doing and what we're thinking, what we're feeling, those kind of things. And this creates an emotional experience of being close or connected to someone else. Hi, Barb. And a relationship of proximity, companionship, intimacy, support, and play develops through this bond. So we feel like we have a tribe. We're included. They're present with us, and we are present with them. Now, this can attachment can become kind of a problem sometimes, especially if we don't have a strong sense of developed self. We don't really know who we are. We don't have a strong sense of our own boundary, our own individuality, our own autonomy. And so we can become a little more enmeshed with the person, which means we're absorbing aspects of them, and making them part of ourselves, without really understanding if those are actually things that are part of ourselves. So you become kind of you know, entangled with them that way. And this leads to a dependence on them for certain things. And in codependency, this is called external orientation. Um, that, that's the cycle that happens there, it creates that. And in codependency, we become largely dependent on the other person for our sense of identity, value, and place in the world, along with the natural uh, dependence we have with being connected with others, which is a sense of tribe, uh, shelter, safety, security, nurture, things like that. So attachment can become a little bit toxic there when we're depending on someone else to define who we are and establish for us what we feel, what we think, what our sense of worth is, uh, our identity, our purposes, things like that. That is an unhealthy attachment. A healthy attachment is I'm an individualized person. I know my boundaries. I know what I want. I can share them. I can communicate them safely, and I can feel safe communicating them and being received in them and while maintaining this closeness the bond isn't uh, shattered it isn't threatened by difference or by saying yes or saying no to things or having limits that kind of thing boundaries 
So this is important to understand. Attachment is a normal human function. We all do it. We do it all the time. We get attached to people, places, and things. Like I'm attached to my car. I'm attached to what I do sometimes. Uh, sometimes I'm attached to uh, people like my kids. I have an attachment to them. Um, I have attachment to people I'm dating, to my friends, to my family. It's really normal. And typically, through the maturation process of a relationship or friendship or connection, that attachment turns into a bond. And there's a difference between the two. Attachments tend to be really rigid and kind of uh, they fracture easy because there's not a lot of trust in, in the attachment yet. But as they mature into trust and we become more secure with this person, uh, secure being ourselves, secure uh, with them being themselves, we create this thing called elasticity and that creates a bond. So we can be ourselves and move around, change things, and they can too. And we're secure that they're not going to abandon us or leave us or anything like that. This kind of security lowers the threat level that we feel in relationship to uh, existential life. Like we instinctively know that we are vulnerable to the world around us. And so we build uh, safety and shelter in response to that through tribe, through connecting with others and building close bonds so that we know that if there was a threat or something, we all had each other's back and we could protect ourselves. Now, children of narcissistic abuse, of alcoholism, of even codependent parents or unattuned parents may not share this. Uh, children who've been abused and neglected don't share this. The world is a scary place and they're alone in that fear. And this creates an enormous need in the codependent, which draws them to stay in relationships, whether or not they're healthy or toxic, to stay in them because at least it provides something. It's better than nothing when it comes to this primal need for that safety and shelter. So be mindful that we're really dealing with core needs here, core need of shelter and protection, core need of safety, acceptance and belonging. These are all part of the core, 10 core needs that we have as human beings. Now, attachment, <laughs> attachment, if it becomes threatened, will create what's called attachment distress. And this shows up when, well, let's talk about the threats first and I'll show you what uh, attachment distress looks like. So attachment distress is the result of a threat being placed against the attachment in some form. And those threats can show up in a lot of different ways. Um, the health decline or onset of disease in someone we're attached to, especially a parent or significant other, a sibling, someone that we love and care about. Um, injury to the relationship that uh, threatens its longevity, like cheating. That'll certainly put people into attachment distress. Um, lying, some sort of betrayal of the commitment, stuff like that. Withdrawal, continued or chronic fighting or conflict that doesn't get resolved. Um, Breaking up with someone will trigger attachment distress. And that distress can be minor or it could be really intense depending on the person, their history and their relationship to attachment as well as their connection to a social, a supportive social network like a family of sorts as well as their own internal resources. We'll talk about more of that in a second. Abandonment by a parent or a caregiver either physically, emotionally, um, uh, relationally, uh, sometimes they die, uh, or they they are abusive or neglectful. That's going to create a sense of abandonment in that child. Any kind of abuse will lead to attachment distress. The seduction abuse discard cycle, the a euphoric distress despair cycles that are part of codependency and trauma bonding, love addiction will create this attachment distress in, in big big ways. And then fundamentally neglect. When we're chronically unseen, unacknowledged, unvalued for our presence and for who we are, we're really going to struggle with, with attachment because we're going to be in distress. And, and attachment distress is funny because we can experience it when we're developing an attachment and a bond with someone. We can experience it when we're losing that attachment. So this is really what uh, is called attachment trauma. It's a huge factor in codependency and in, especially in love addiction, it's one of the primary drivers behind our compulsion to keep people, fix people, change people, so we don't have to confront the uh, gut, the gutting experience of being abandoned or terminating 
a um, connection with someone because then we have to confront our own loneliness, our own emptiness, and that intensity that comes with it. A lot of times with that shame. So attachment distress shows up with some very specific signals. There's an intense anxiety about being left or abandoned. This may exist regardless of the health of the relationship. So you can be with a healthy person and they're behaving in very secure and predictable ways and you're still going to have that intensity. You're dealing with an attachment trauma there, an abandonment trauma. Um, a fixation on trying to control things so they don't change or they change in a way that you're safe with. Uh, that's a big, big one. I mean, it's something I wrestle with a lot um, because we feel intrinsically powerless over other people, places, and things. And a lot of times we've invested too much time and energy controlling them rather than building our own resources for our own autonomy, our own sense of power, our own well-being. Now, when it comes to love addiction and trauma bonding, there can be an intense craving and obsession with changing the other person, monitoring their behaviors, prying into their life, spying on them, stalking them, things like that. Because we want to feel secure and we think that if we're controlling them and we're really aware of what they're doing, we'll feel secure. But there's an irony in that because we don't trust them. And that's one of the biggest motivators of attachment distress is distrust. Attachment is built on trust, and trust is earned by a person's consistency in showing up and respecting boundaries, uh, accountability, integrity, being non-judgmental, um, being generous, kind, and warm to you, things like that. Another major signal of attachment to stress is anger, specifically anger at being left, or not being loved, or not being loved as much as you think they ought to love you, or wondering why they wouldn't work things out the way you would have worked things out. This is kind of a projection onto them of yourself. You're projecting what you are onto them rather than seeing them for who they are. And there can be a lot of hostility towards them, a lot of anger and aggression towards them because underneath that you're very, very scared about losing the attachment and the connection to them and having to confront the vulnerability that that creates. Then there can be a strong sense of betrayal when they change their minds or alter commitments. And that, that's where it can get a little dicey, but I, I've personally experienced when people change minds on things, I get a jolt of anxiety. And that took me a while to work that out. And I really came down to trust. It came down to trust that I'm still valued, still wanted, and still important. Um, it's just that there's a condition in, uh, in their world in which they need to make a change. And so you gotta got to regulate that down and build trust and security and there's a specific process to that that we teach in uh, the addiction to connection course and also in the upcoming relationship strategy course so rigidity and letting people be who they are is the next signal like they need to be the same person all the time every time and that feels like for the other person it feels controlling it feels smothering it feels like you're walking on eggshells we're not able or willing to give people space to be fluid and dynamic and to flux and change and 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 do them because we're scared that their change is a signal that they're going to leave us or that we're not uh, loved by them anymore and a lot of times this will be internalized as i'm not lovable anymore things like that so these are the common signals of attachment distress so there's a way we we handle this so in in from addiction to connection attachment distress is one of the major things we focus on and we work on healing it because we, we technically we don't heal it we regulate it and then we build stronger bonds and safety both with ourselves and with others and we, so we do that in a couple of different ways and the first way we do that is what's with a tool that i call the adr it stands for attachment distress regulator and this is an internal process that i put you through that helps you connect with an internal resource like an inner mother an inner father an inner protector and then they take over the role of protecting you and nurturing your inner child or your inner selves, help you build out a sense of safety emotionally within yourself that you can pull to that resource when you need to feel safe. And then we, we attach that experience with a physical object like a ring or keys or something that you can have on you on a frequent basis. So when you're feeling that anxiety or distress, you can touch that and hold it and it will trigger this, this sense of security and bond within you. It's a lot like a safety blanket for a child. And this is actually why children have safety objects is because that's a way they feel safe in the world. 
So we're just using that kind of concept to help regulate ourselves and build ourselves up. And then we add to the ADR, we add external connection. And this is done by learning how to detect healthy people and build secure bonds with them, by understanding how trust works, how bonding works, uh, through consistent patterns and behavior. When you have both of these in place, your sense of attachment distress will drop significantly and you'll be able to weather the storms that you confront in your life, especially when you have to end relationships or start relationships. You'll be able to regulate that down and feel secure in yourself. So I got some questions here. So Laura says, I find myself helping others in ways that I actually need myself. Yes, so yeah, yeah. Stop fixing myself through others. Rather than look at, uh, one, one way you can reverse that is one, you don't need to fix yourself because there's nothing wrong with who you are. Um, what you've got going on there is unmet needs. So look at the need and see how you can get that met in a healthy, proactive way, either with inside yourself or with another or both. And usually, and I encourage this, both. Because we are interdependent beings. We're not independent or codependent beings. Right. And then Kelly asks, does a, a non-codependent person experience attachment distress when trust has been disputed due to others? Yeah, absolutely. Um, attachment distress is a pretty universal experience. The intensity of that distress can vary widely. And uh, codependents have an enormous amount of attachment distress with it. Um, anybody who's been a victim of any kind of abuse, chronic abuse, will experience that. Or that they have lived through what's called transactionalism, transactional love. They've got to earn the love. That's going to put you into high attachment distress. Uh, but the more secure you become bonded with yourself inwardly through this process I call uh, the connection practice and uh, from addiction to connection, the more secure you become in that, and the more legitimized you become as a person with your own feelings, your own identity, your own power, your own position. And the more you build uh, experience success in building healthy bonds with others, that attachment distress will plummet. So there you go, guys. So attachment distress is a biggie, and it's an important and one of the primary things we focus on on the healing element of codependency. So again, there's three steps to healing codependency. One is heal yourself. Two, know yourself. Three, share yourself. And this focus with attachment distress is completely in step one, heal yourself. And I address step one of healing yourself through my system called uh, Rapid Heal Live Mentoring Edition, and that includes the heal course, which is a 12-week process of healing the shame, fear, guilt, and fatigue or the emotional trauma of narcissistic abuse. And then the second element of that stage or that course is the From Addiction to Connection course where we heal the trauma bond, we heal the craving for the narcissist, we become more individualized and, and um, connected with ourselves. Because there's three specific things we accomplish in addic From Addiction to Connection. First, we bring peace to your body and your mind through regulation and the ADR practice and stuff like that. Second, we bring sanity back into your reality so you understand what's really going on so you can make effective decisions for yourself. That means we break the fantasy and we get connected to the raw, sober reality of what's really happening. And three, we build strong bonds with ourselves and with others so that we do not need to be addicted anymore. Instead, we have a flourishing ecosystem of relationship that help us move forward. So if this is you and this is speaking to you, then you've got an opportunity to work with me live for the next eight weeks in a live group setting where we tackle this, this um, these three steps with restoring peace, restoring connection, and restoring sanity through From Addiction to Connection. We start June 28th, so just under two and a half weeks. Um, I'm only accepting 40 people into this. I only teach this once a year, and this is it for 2020. Um, the uh, we have 33 s spots available, so I I recommend hopping in because typically within the next two weeks these things just get gobbled up. It's just kind of like the pattern. Everybody wants to wait till the last minute. And phew, they they hop in. This is your chance to work with me live. You also get what's called I've Got Your Back live mentoring hours with this. This is where you get connected with me biweekly on Sundays and Tuesdays, where I'll help you in a live group setting uh, through the process give you the support you can see that you're not alone in this and that we've got your back both myself and the community you get that for a lifetime forever so that comes with that program if you want to enroll the link is above 
on Facebook, below on YouTube. Click on that and jump in. I'd be happy to have you. Be honored to have you as one of my my students and clients be able to assist you in breaking free. So guys, I appreciate you. Please remember that you're worth knowing, loving, and keeping. And that you can be free of this distress. You can be free of the craving for the narcissist and the enmeshment with the sad cycle and the EDD cycle. And you can be happy again. I know because I've accomplished it and I've helped hundreds of others accomplish it through this process. Okay? And that process is restoring peace, restoring sanity, and restoring connection. Okay, guys. Thank you. I appreciate you. If you have any questions, feel free to PM me about the course. And let me know if you need anything and have a great day. Okay. Bye-bye.